Remember that store when you'd go in trying to resell the games that you bought originally that were $60 a piece and they tried to buy them back from you for $2 a piece? That store called GameStop? Well, past few weeks, its stock has jumped from 20 to 400, mainly because of a meme. So if you invested in any hashtag Dogecoin lately, good for you. Hopefully you got out before it dropped, but I'm not here to talk about stocks, but I am here to talk about stock photography. So what is stock photography? Now I guarantee you most likely come across stock photography when you're searching online through various images. And let's say you look up an image of a map and you're trying to just get the outline, you're just trying to get the download for whatever reason. For some reason there's a bunch of X's or squiggles or words across it. And that's most likely because it's on a stock photography website. Now stock photography can be literally anything you can think of and it's just a series of images that photographers have given to different companies and those companies allow people to download them and then those people pay a subscription to download them and that's how money is made from it. Now as a contributor or a photographer, you make a very small percentage of each download. So unfortunately with stock photography, there's so much of it out there that it takes a while to make any kind of money from it. So it's mostly something you basically use as passive income as a photographer, unless you're basically pushing through stock photography every single day and your setup is to basically take stock photography photos that you can see clients wanting and you can make money from it that way. But just speaking from experience, I've had about 100 or so images up on my own stock photography contribution page on Shutterstock and I've made a total of $12 over three years. But don't let those numbers dissuade you. It's only my fault why I've made so little money passively through stock photography. The $12 I made has really actually been $10 through this year alone of just photos of my dog. And because of that, I was thinking, I might as well take more photos of just anything I can find. So I'm gonna start with that in my room now, just trying to find about 100 different things that I could potentially take stock photography of, starting with this hat. and flash. So to explain my setup a little bit, I've got my backdrop draped over my table and I got my flash ready to light whatever object I've got. Now you might be pretty gun ho to just start grabbing things in your house and taking photos of them. But you have to keep in mind that there are some rules to actually taking stock photos. For example, a GoPro, perfect, because who doesn't need a GoPro or who isn't looking for images of a GoPro online? The problem is this is considered intellectual property. So even if you remove all the logos, most stock websites can still tell that it's still a GoPro, so you can't use it. Another example is art or any kind of thing that could be considered art. Even though it's got no logo on it, you probably found it out of nowhere. If the stock website thinks it could be considered art and maybe have an artist that has ownership of it, you can't use it because it's still considered intellectual property. For example, what you can use is a blue cup. This blue cup has no logo on it. I can basically edit out the stick if I choose to edit out the bottom of it. And there's really no claim on it whatsoever. So a blue cup, it's a great example of something you could use for your stock photography portfolio. So I totally forgot to even take a photo of this hat. I kind of totally forgot it was even on my head when I was taking the photos, but where I'm going to be going next, for my next location to get some stock photography, I won't be able to wear this hat because it's going to be too windy and potentially wet outside. I'm going to have to upgrade to a much warmer hat if you catch my drift. <laughs>
So if that looks janky at all, I'm trying to shoot all my b-roll in 60 frames per second today instead of typically 120. Just to see if autofocus can kind of help me out or not, but I'm holding you by the edge of my hand and it's the camera is just so heavy I gotta put you guys down. I really have no idea how vloggers do this. And that's a lot easier. I feel like vloggers have to have the strongest arms just because of how often they're just holding a camera as far out in front of them as possible. But when it comes to stock photography outside, people like to go towards things that are kind of unique, kind of like cars, but the problem is with cars, they're covered in trademarks and logos, so most stock websites won't accept them. So when you go to go do outside photos, you gotta think of things that aren't covered in logos, and they're things that are everywhere and vary in shape and form. So all of stuff can be like trees, leaves, snow, footprints, dirt, rocks, just various things that form in nature that are all different and unique. So that's what I'm gonna focus on here around the reservoir, just trying to find things in nature that I could take photos of that I could see someone using for a presentation or try to manipulate in some sort of program. They're just like things that they could easily find on stock photography that just might not be around them that could be useful to their projects. So I'm gonna get going with that and we'll move on to the next spot later. One thing that you can do when you're taking stock photos is remember to look up. And when I say look up, not literally look up, but if you look at the clouds, every single cloud formation in photos is completely different. So unfortunately, you can't have perfect clouds every time you go out to take photos. So the photographers especially need various photos of the sky at different times during the day for the photos they're taking if they need to replace it. So when you're out taking stock photos, Make sure to look up and just take a handful of photos of whatever the environment's giving you. But do you, do you guys hear that? It's getting louder. It was the boys. So dogs are fantastic for stock photography because some people out there are dog lovers and people just are always looking for cute dog photos. So they're really distracted right now because I've got two dog biscuits in my hand and you need to have dog treats when you're doing photos of dogs to just keep their attention. But when you're taking stock photography photos of the dogs, you just have to remember that there are some things you need to be careful about. For example, you don't want branded logos on the dogs at all, so Morty's collar here, I'm gonna have to take off. Even though it's my favorite school, my alma mater UNC, you gotta take it off so that doesn't show up in the stock website. And Finney over here, his fur is so thick that you really can't see his collar, but things you wanna keep in mind is if you can see a name or a telephone number on the collar, then you're gonna to have to either Photoshop it out or just take the collar off because that will also get flagged as an issue. And one thing is taking photos inside of dogs really doesn't look that great because it just looks like your house. So the best place to take stock photos of dogs is definitely outside, which is where we're gonna to have to go, boys, right? You guys wanna go play in the snow? Let's go, Moy. So just a few more tips on taking photos of dogs or stock photos. Hey, I know you'll get some cookies soon, I promise. But you don't wanna shoot at 2.8 because the problem is it's gonna be way too open. You won't get enough of the dog in focus for a stock photo. So you wanna shoot closer to F8 or F10 potentially to make sure that the whole dog's in focus so that the website is happy. And you don't want your ISO to be way too high because even if it's around 800, which isn't that high, that's still too much noise and grain for the stock website to accept. You just want to make sure you stay closer to that 400 range if you're taking photos of dogs to upload. Finn, you're being such a good doggo that I will give you this cookie. So dogs don't have a lot of patience. You got to make sure you have all those treats as I mentioned earlier. These guys don't have much more patience with me in the snow right now. They just want to play or either go inside. I've got an old man and a puppy. That's Finn's way of saying that he's kind of tired of this and wants to go back inside, so 
I'm gonna hand you out to the editing team. Now to upload all these photos into the computer. Wait, where's my card? Doesn't make any sense. Ah, looks like I had a card up my sleeve. For some tips about how to edit these photos in Lightroom, the first thing I want to do is make sure that the camera calibration is on and that you can remove the chromatic aberrations that there might be in the photo because stock websites hate that for some reason. Also, I want to make sure that my photo or my object is definitely centered as much as possible. Just making sure that my subject is definitely directly centered in the actual frame because if it's off to the side, Shutterstock or any other website could be like, hey, this is off, it's weird, it doesn't count. So I'm gonna do that. And also the histogram is a little to the left. So I'm gonna bring up the lightness of the image just a little bit to make sure we get a nice even exposure because you don't wanna give something that's too overexposed or too underexposed to a stock website. And the last final touch you wanna do is to make sure that it's properly white balanced and since I have the gray backdrop that's like the perfect neutral density tone for white balance, I just need to make sure I select an area that's not too heavily shadowed or too bright, someone that's right in the middle. So that way I can make sure that my white balance is perfectly balanced. For the outdoor photos, besides making things are cropped correctly, the white balance is correct and it's exposed evenly, you have to definitely double check that there's no logos in it. And if you do find a logo, you have to take the few extra minutes to Photoshop it out or it's gonna get flagged and rejected. For example, in this toe zone, no parking anytime sign, we've got this little three letters right here, DCR, that counts as a logo. For the dog photos, and then this just comes in portraits in general, but one thing you wanna make sure that you don't mess up in your stock photos is that the horizon line is off. Now in the image, it looks like my subject is aligned properly, he's in the center, his face is directly in the center of the image, it's exposed properly, and if you look at the background, you can notice that the horizon line of this lake is slightly up, and so the stock website will notice that and then flag it. So with all your photos outside, you just have to make sure that your horizon line is as even as possible, just to guarantee that it won't get flagged. Even though it's barely a difference in the image, it will make a difference to the uploading website if you screw it up. Before you export your photos from whatever editing software you're using, you just want to keep in mind that you need your photos to be at least a few specific requirements. So you should just take it one quick second and just check the stock website's basic requirements for your photos before you basically export everything and try to upload everything and then it doesn't work. Just taking a few quick seconds could help you in the long run save about 20 to 30 minutes worth of time trying to figure this all out. So for example on Shutterstock, you just need to make sure your file format is a JPEG it does accept TIFFs, but you wanna make sure that there's no layers. So just save it as a JPEG, it'll be a smaller file. You wanna make sure you've got the right color profile. The Shutterstock images are offered in sRGB, but if you submit them in a different color profile, the colors will most likely be converted or slightly off. So just make sure you change them over before you export. And you wanna make sure that the images are at least four megapixels. This can be a huge kind of issue because if you crop a photo down without thinking about it, it could end up being smaller than that. So as you export it, just make sure you hit the resize my image to four or five megapixels when you're exporting it. And then there's a few other guidelines, but you just wanna make sure that you've got enough pixels and you've got a sharp enough resolution so that the stock website fully accepts your photo. So uploading your images is the simplest part. It's just a quick kind of drag and drop or you just hit select multiple files and then it'll pull up basically your Windows or document page, whatever kind of operating system you're using. One thing you want to remember is you can only upload a hundred photos at a time. So don't select all of them. Select like a 10 by 10 kind of format or if you can basically reshape or resize the document images to do 10 by 10. So then it's easier to figure out so I can count 10 over and then 10 down. And then it'll take a few minutes for all your photos to fully upload into the browser. To submit the content, you're basically gonna select the images. Now, if you took three or four different angles of one item, you can select all of them by basically hitting the check mark on each one. And then basically the description you fill out will be the description for all of them. So I got three different objects, I can't do that. So for example, I'm gonna click on this chair. 
description. Got to make sure it's at least five boards for Shutterstock. Just going to do brown wooden chair, isolated in a backdrop. Then you need to make sure you have at least one category. So I'm going to do object because a chair is an object. And since it really doesn't have a furniture kind of thing, I'm going to do miscellaneous to be just whatever. You also need keywords for it too. So the good thing is they can kind of figure out what you have. So it's going to give you a bunch of suggested keywords like chair, furniture, design, and so on. And you're allowed to submit up to 50. I can only really ever get to 25 or 28 because it's hard to think of like different things that it could possibly be because most people will be just searching generic terms and the keywords will help your objects find it. So I suggest try to get to at least 15 if it doesn't generate a lot or 20 or 25. If you can get plus 30, you're doing fantastic. And after that, all you do is hit submit and then I'll just go into a pending object and basically someone from Shutterstock will eventually get to it and decide if it's good or not. One thing you will want to notice is that sometimes it'll take two images, same ISO, same light output, and one image will get flagged for too much noise and the other will be fine. That's just this weird like learning curve thing. So going forward, you want to try to limit how much ISO you have to bump up. I found is that if I bumped up over 400, that's when it gets kind of dicey. So if you can shoot between 100 and 400 ISO in your shoots, that's the best kind of range to shoot at. I hope some of this information was helpful and kind of just kind of opens up to what could actually be considered stock photography and kind of help making money if it's especially just sitting around your room collecting dust or if it's just been sitting in your hard drive forever doing absolutely nothing for you. For example, if you're a travel photographer but you don't have any of these photos that you're going to sell or post, you could probably throw them on stock websites and collect a few dollars from them over time because one of the best things you can do is find ways to just increase your passive income to continue to fund your passions. So I hope this video was helpful and as always, let's recap.